Good afternoon and welcome to the 454th Imagine Buffalo program and another great virtual Imagine lecture hosted by the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. My name is Joy Testis Inquino and I'm filling in for the beloved Dennis Galucki who is traveling today. Thank you so much for joining us. The program today is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History and Nature and also imaginelifelonglearning.com. Everyone on the program today is muted during our speaker's presentation. If you do have a question, type it into the chat box. We'll get to as many as possible after the presentation. The program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page and YouTube channels, and you can share the link with your networks. Now to our featured speakers, both longtime friends of the library, Itina Farid Cook and Aaron Ott, Itina initially pursued creative expression in words and later photography and music, but has since become an accomplished Christian hip hop artist and award-winning photographer. She has established her own photography and film company called Get Focused Productions. And she's a coordinator and educator with various local not-for-profits, really dedicating herself to helping young people claim the power to rewrite their own stories. Fareed Cook's original work has been featured at the SEPA Gallery, Jamestown Community College, Frank Lloyd Wright's Martin House, and here at the Downtown Central Library, to name a few. Aaron Ott is the curator of public art at Albright Knox. In his role, he aims to create spaces of dialogue where diverse communities have the ability to engage with and respond with great public art. It has been noted that Ott's philosophy is grounded in the notion that our shared landscape is abundant with opportunities to create, experience, and talk about beauty, culture, originality, and innovation. Our discussion today focuses on the Albright Knox Northlands exhibition, In These Truths which focuses on Black artists, both emerging and established, who, through a wide range of mediums, provoke and reconsider, defy and embrace, test and talk about a shared reality. As our celebrated curators, Itina and Aaron, please tell us about this exhibit. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, my name is Aaron Ott. I'm the curator of public art at the Albright Knox. Um, and yeah, this, this exhibition came about from longstanding communications that we held with our community that date back uh, all the way to the Freedom Wall, really, um, which uh, Adris Wajed, our other co-curator, uh, was part of, and uh, Julia Bottoms, who's in the exhibition, was part of. And a lot of that conversation, um, centered around representation and visibility. And in addition to uh, representation and visibility of artists, um, one of the things that uh, Idris and Itina talked quite a bit about was uh, opportunities for the Albright as a platform for uh, curatorial visions as well. And so that's when um, you know, I reached out to Itina and Idris to discuss the possibility of co-curating an exhibition of all Black artists, and um, <laughs> two years later, uh, we have an exhibition. Yes, yeah, so I'll yeah. pop in <laughs> as well. I just, um, it's a, a beautiful opportunity for like-minded individuals, but also um, a bit of diverse and you know, um, coming from different spaces and mediums to come together and to create this orchestra, you know, of artists to to showcase their work. Um, but like like Aaron said, having the opportunity to kind of give an give an opportunity for people to look into black art and understand that it's not one thing; it's many things. And so um, going through the process of working with Aaron and Idris, we were able to really identify a plethora of amazing artists from many different spaces that really spoke similar languages, but also offered an opportunity to look into different perspectives. Um, it, it was an amazing opportunity and um, I'm quite honored to be able to be part of it. 
Yeah, and am I sharing my screen now? Hopefully, hopefully people can see. Yes, some yes, you are. Of the exhibition, and and so you know, one of the things that that Itina and, and Idris and I really wanted to discuss in this exhibition, you know, we all are are very passionate, very excited about um, artists, and the what you're seeing on the screen right now is a is a installation view of the exhibition on, on display, and you know, we had, I mean probably close to 100 names between the three of us of, of artists that we were really interested in and, and that ran an obvious gamut. Um, but as we began to discuss, you know, options, I think working with living artists became really important to us. Um, working with artists both locally and nationally and ultimately internationally, we have three artists from Toronto who joined the exhibition um, to sort of broaden the notion of a, of a North American lived experience. And also to point to the experience of uh, being in Black culture and being a Black creator as a non-homogenous kind of experience, right? I think oftentimes, um, I've spoken about this a little bit in, in other venues, but I think that sometimes there can be um, this tendency to refer to uh, the community or the public when you're sort of talking about the kinds of um, publics that we, that we serve, right? It's easy to say, well, public art, so we serve the public. But those are different, different demographics and those are very different people and lived experiences. And I think you need to take that into account. And so it, the same is true of not trying to distill the black community into one thing and to recognize that it's a, a very diverse kind of range of producers. And here in this photograph, right, you can see you know, local producers in Julia's work and uh, Yemi's photograph that has kind of been a, an anchor point of the exhibition alongside Kamal Grantham and, and Stacey Robinson in the background with Nina Chanel Abney and, and Derek Forger, national recognized artists. So, you know, something that we really wanted to kind of um, have a viewer experience in this space is a sense of uh, discovery and even um, provocation. I mean, we talked a little bit about what it meant to really uh, include viewers in a discussion and, and have them ask questions about what it is uh, that they're that they're seeing in these spaces, um, and we also took that opportunity to you know look at talent in our own community. This is an installation view of Phyllis Thompson's work, and Phyllis is a local artist. Studio, uh, she has a studio at Buffalo Art Studios, and if you have the chance on um, the uh, Fourth Fridays um, and the T Fourth Fridays at Buffalo Art Studios, you can roam around those studios and, and meet Phyllis. She's quite lovely, but the, the work here on the left and center is hers, flanked by um, James Littles on the right. But you know, this was work that was new to Artina and I. We were familiar with Phyllis's monoprint work, but not as familiar with um, her work here from the mid 1970s. Uh, and it's really astonishing work, especially in when contextualized with Albright Knox's um, substantial holdings of abstract expressionist works. And so, you know, when we were privileged enough to hold a studio visit, which was very difficult during the pandemic, you know, this was this was quite a discovery. And I think it points towards why, you know, I'm interested in as many people as possible seeing the exhibition, but also hopefully continuing, you know, a collaborative relationship with Itina and Idris, because and you know, we didn't get to do a lot of studio visits. I think we would have discovered so much more. And yeah. we've said again and again that this is only, you know, kind of um, scratching the surface that even as this show with 23 artists is intended to sort of suggest and, 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 and open a dialogue about the sort of non-homogenous aspect of Black culture and Black communities, that this is just a microcosm of that reality. Um, so yeah, maybe Itina, you can talk about, because I know this work impacted you quite a bit too. Can I, can I jump in and just say something? <laughs> Julia Bottoms actually um, has done a mural in one of our libraries, uh, mm -hmm. the Leroy Coles Library in Buffalo and her work in your image is sort of now in the middle of the white background as well. So mm -hmm. we were proud to see that that she's part of this exhibit as well. And folks can see her, her beautiful mural at our library anytime that library is open. So we're yeah, proud to be part of this as well. It's a fantastic opportunity to see, you know, she's got four works here, two of which were on display at Buffalo Art Studios previously uh, late last year. One work that was painted literally this year, 2022, the, the sort of red uh, and pink one there. And then the, the work all the way to the right is a really fascinating work from 2008. 
And I really encourage people to see it in person because it's an astonishing artifact. It is in fact, Julia's first painting, which is a, a, a crazy uh, uh, reality when you stand in front of it because the skill that she displayed with the, the very first time that she picked up a brush and, and put uh, paint to, in this case, panel, um, it's really a, an amazing, um, uh, artifact and, and piece of work and, and shows the, the skill level that she started with, the inherent skill level that she started with, but the growth that she's uh, displayed from 2008 to, to today. Yeah, there's, there's a vast number of pieces of work in this, in this space, um, about 59 pieces, right, Aaron? It's 59 works of art. Yeah. 59 it's, works it's, of art. And it, it would have been more if, if, um, <laughs> If they if they let us, I'll, I'll tell you what. When we first started, um, you know, Aaron uh, told us, you know, dream big, and we're like, okay, you know, 10, 10 artists, <laughs> thinking that that was a lot. He's like, no, no, go ahead, and then it, that turned into you know the, the twenty three, and I I believe like for me, um, walking through that space, being that I'm from the east side of Buffalo, um, born and raised. And being that like I was surrounded by the arts growing up, I had many opportunities to uh, see art, um, envision myself within it, to understand it. And I don't remember ever walking into a space and, and seeing art and knowing that all of the artists look like me or may come from where I come from. And so the significance of being part of something like this is, is huge for me because my mind is always, my mind and heart is always on young people and um, regardless of where they come from, I don't, I, and what they look like and whatever the case is, just being able to give young people the opportunity to expand their, their perspectives in different ways. I think it's important for anyone, everyone to um, be able to walk into a space knowing like, oh, these, this is a diverse group of work. You know, you have figurative, you have um, abstract work, you have uh, performance, you have uh, multimedia involved in this. And then the, you know, the icing or the, the cherry on top is the fact that they're, they're all, they all come from a, a culture in which some people may not think that this is possible. And, and I love the fact that this is possible and it was an opportunity to make happen so that people can see like, oh, this is, this is needed more and on a higher scale. Um, but just to kind of talk about um, the work, but I don't know if you have any pieces of Vanessa German. Um, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but just to kind of speak to Oh my goodness, my favorite, one of my favorite pieces um, is Vanessa German. Uh, she's from Pittsburgh, right? Pittsburgh artist. And th these pieces, as you walk in, this is like the first thing that hits you. These, these pieces, she has a total of three, but this one that has the stop sign with the bags and things like that. It's interesting that I always come right back to this um, one of the things that stood out the most to me is the cowrie shells, especially the one in the mouth, and that the fact that you see a lot of the pieces uh, within almost every piece of work, every work of art, for the most part, this repetition, this pattern of cowrie shells, the pattern of um, there's an Afro pick in some of the pieces, uh, the flowers, uh, just these consistent representations of what I understand to be significant within my culture and to see it constantly throughout the, the space. Yeah, like this, um, just to see that was interesting to me. Uh, I know this piece that you're showing right now, I feel like it, it's such a connection to Black culture, if you will. Um, as soon as people enter into the space and they look and they see the cotton inside of the um, 
a side of the machines or the hair that's hanging down um, inside of the uh, kind of like the candy. What would you call these? Like gum, gumball, yeah, machines. Gumball. Yeah, gumball machines. I yeah. didn't want to say gumball, but yeah, that's what they are. So this idea of this commodity, things for commodity, these pieces of my culture, black culture, and what I understand it to be, um, like when I saw this being put together, because this particular piece was created just for this exhibition. This was never before done. Um, and seeing it come together, I would get excited to see some of the pieces in the gumball machines. But then I learned more in depth about why it existed in that space to begin with. Like there's watermelons in one of them. And there's such a Unfortunately, there's a negative connotation when it comes to watermelon in the Black culture. But then you learn about where it came from and how watermelon was like the, the main moneymaker for a lot of Black people back in the day. And then it got pulled down, if you will, or looked down upon or frowned upon because of the um, stigma that was attached to it. But just seeing those different pieces, these different you know, important pieces within the culture and, and seeing how there's a perspective of negativity, but there's a perspective of beauty and positivity. And I feel like that is threaded throughout the whole exhibit. Um, and and it's, it's like looking at your truth, uh, understanding someone's truth, and then trying to identify what new pieces uh, exist or you can attach to um, your truths moving further. So yes, dynamic. Um, Aaron, we we absolutely do not have enough time to really no. <laughs> break all of this down, but um, you guys have to come down. I'm going to pass it to you if there's some other signif significant pieces you want to mention. Yeah, Aaron, tell us the location, everything. I'm not sure if everybody knows um, where the Northland Center is. And if you haven't been out there yet, you need to get out there because this is through June, right? Through yeah. June. Yeah, yes. so, so the Albright Knox Northland is located at 612 uh, Northland. Um, so we're on we're on Northland between Fillmore and Grider, just a block south of, of Delavan. We're, you know, right off the 33, very easy to get to. Um, if you haven't been, now's the opportunity. This is the final exhibition for uh, our work at Albright Knox Northland. Um, so this is on view until June 5th. Um, we're open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, Fridays noon to 7. Saturdays and Sundays, 10 to five. Um, we, we do ask just um, because it's helpful for us to, to track uh, people and help during what is still a, technically a pandemic period that you um, uh, reserve tickets, which again are free um, online, but we do accept walk-ups of course. Um, we love donations, but I, I do wanna reiterate that this is a free space and we want people to come uh, and see it so that people, you know, of, of any means and all all walks can kind of can come and see the work. And and you know, this this particular view that you're seeing of Stacy Robinson and Kamal Grantham's work, Stacy a, a UB grad and Kamal Grantham, a, a Buffalo born and raised um, artist, both now living and working in um, uh, uh, Urbana Champaign. Um, you know, they they created this work. Uh, specifically for the space because it was, you know, big enough to, to hold. And that's, so that's something that we really kind of want to take advantage of in this space was kind of like, what can we do with, you know, scale showing this work that's, you know, 11 feet round, around um, with, uh, I don't have a shot of it here, but um, somewhere here in the back, it's a little difficult to see, but you know, we have a Rocky Ford piece that's 16 feet tall and we had to actually build an 18 foot wall just to hold it. Here you have Nina Chanel Abney's work to the left that is, you know, um, it's probably 14 or 15 feet long. <laughs> so, you know, the ability to kind of show work in this space is, is quite unique. And we had a number of, of artists that really were excited about the, the challenges and, and the, the unique location because you know, we are a museum setting and we are, you know, a, a globally recognized um, producer of exhibitions but you know it was said to me that a lot of times especially black producers may not have you know direct uh, access to these kinds of platforms and so many of them would have started in otherwise alternative spaces right um galleries that are ad hoc or maybe in um non-traditional locations and so some of the work that that you're seeing here would have been the kind that you know we would have seen 
uh, in in untraditional locations. Um, and there's a wide variety of work, you know, um, there's work that, you know, one of the pieces that I know Idris really fell in love with was uh, this work Solace by Alana Clark. And this is a work that is entirely made with hair bonding glue. And um, it's one of those things that uh, Idris described it as the most hip hop piece in the exhibition. Just this yeah. sort of notion of taking a material that's not necessarily intended to do the thing that you're asking it to do. And then, you know, remixing it in a way that is visionary. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are these moments uh, in the exhibition where somebody might just see, you know, a kind of rubberized black mass on the wall and it might not speak to them, but other people kind of go, wait a minute, you know, what is this? And if you, um, if you go up and you read the label, you'll find out that she, you know, is Trinidadian and that, you know, her mother tried to take control of, you know, cultural, you know, beauty and that Alana didn't want to be a part of and, you know, hair to obviously black women and Itina can talk more about this is, you know, an important cultural element and, and can sometimes come with, uh, with trauma, you know, which, which this piece definitely deals with. So I think that there's a lot to discover in this exhibition. Yeah, for what, sure. What happens um, to these pieces when it's over? Do these become part of the, the collection at Albright? Oh, you know, I, I would I would love for uh, all of the work to become part of the collection. That would be delightful. We are going to make um, recommendations to the board for several works in this exhibition to become part of the exhibition. In fact, this particular work cannot become part of the exhibition. It's already slated to become part of a private collection by uh, a collector in London um, after the exhibition. And, and, you know, with 59 works of art again by 23 artists, I think it would be quite difficult, um, both in just storage and, and financially to, to acquire that much. But, you know, we do have a commitment. You know, one of the things that we talked about um, in this exhibition, not only are, are we working with living artists, but we're working with a limited number of artists that are already in the collection. So Richard Hunt, born 1935, and he's still living and working, um, does have this one piece in the collection. Um, you can see it was made in 1956. It was actually purchased by Seymour Knox in 1959 and then gifted to the gallery, or I'm sorry, in 1958, and then gifted to the gallery in 1959. And then we have this Tony Lewis piece that is in the collection, a 2015 piece that was acquired anonymously in 2016. Um, but the rest of the works by, by the artists in the exhibition, um, none of them are, are in the collection. And so, you know, we definitely want to kind of show people, again, the breadth uh, of the work that we have. Um, you know, I've said for a long time, I, I really fell in love with, um, with Phyllis Thompson's work. This is the In Vito series. Um, and I, I think this has been another kind of anchor point for the exhibition of people just, you know, discovering what is right in our own backyard. And, and sometimes you don't even recognize, right? I mean, I always say that as a curator, I'm, I'm constantly asking artists, what are they most excited about? And the common answer, of course, is whatever they're working on right now. So, you know, it wasn't like Phyllis was like, oh, I really wanna show you work that's 45 years old, but we were floored. I mean, we, we, what, we turned like what was gonna be like a 45 minute studio visit into like a two hour studio visit because we just kept on pulling stuff out of the flat files and, falling in love. So um, I do I do imagine that, that a number of works will enter the collection after the exhibition. The One of the particularities about Northland is that it's a non-climate controlled space. It's quite comfortable right now because we do have heat, um, but we don't have air conditioning in the summer, which limits our ability to show certain kinds of work. It certainly limits our ability to show anything in the collection. Um, and it is that's the reason that the show is closing when it's closing. I wish I could extend it, but uh, uh, for those of uh, uh, those of you who visited us last summer with Hervé Toulet's exhibition, no, it can get uh, it can get pretty warm in Albright Knox, Northland. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. so, so this is. Can you talk a little bit about the title in these truths? Who who wrote that, or was that was that decided before you ever saw any of the pieces of work? Yeah, uh, so the yeah, title maybe. kind of shifted many many different times I'd, I feel like, you know, we, we talked about fires, right. That kind mm -hmm. of popped off of, um, James Baldwin's work, um, the fire this time or the fire next time, I believe we were playing with that. Yeah. I think overall, we really just wanted to be able to have an opportunity to have stories be told through the, the work. And when we started to play with truths, 
or the idea of what truth is and what truth is to us as a as a whole um as a whole but then what is truth to black culture black community and then specifically like artists um this we be I, you know started to unravel and um become this in these truths i think there was a couple of different renditions of there, it there, yeah there were i mean again Artina's correct we started with with the fire um the fire this time the fire this next time that kind of linguistic play off of baldwin but then there were a number of other shows coming out with similar titles. Yeah. Um, and at the time I, you know, I started writing, I mean, Artina and Idris and I have been working on this for quite some time. I mean, I, I recall writing, you know, pretty emotionally after um, George Floyd's murder. And, you know, there were a number of kind of contemporaneous uh, elements that, that found me kind of picking apart um, notions of uh, sort of foundational elements of, culture and and the sort of uh, structures that we find ourselves somewhat stuck in, right? This notion of, of systemic racism, of these systems that we find ourselves, whether white or black, trapped by. Um, and I, I found myself kind of picking apart, you know, again, foundational documents and, and kind of thinking about the notion of in these, in, you know, in these truths, we find, you know, self-evident kind of humanity and I just found that like, I was like, well, is it self-evident? What are the truths? Who's, who, who was this true for? And I felt like there were so much that we could learn from these kind of creative individuals that would both reflect a common truth, one that we could find common ground on, we could find our humanity in, but one that almost certainly was going to, again, kind of provoke or, or um, you know, just get people thinking about something that they don't relate to, something that's a new truth for them to consider. And, and so it was through that sort of linguistic term that we, we came up with um, the show title. And then as Itina said, you know, we started with <laughs> 10 artists, uh, Andrea Alvarez's wonderful exhibition, Comunidades Visibles had uh, six or seven artists in it. And we thought, well, that's about all you can hold in this yeah. space. And then we just kept on saying yes and yes and yes to artists so that, that yeah. it ultimately came out to be 23. <laughs> um, I, I want to add to um, yeah, in these truths, the, the concept there also that one of the, one of the biggest things there is <clears throat> many times, like I'll speak personally, like as a woman, um, you know, African-American or what, whatever titles, they give us uh, due to our skin color. Um, a lot of times, truth. There's these ideas of tr what truth is for this community, black culture, black community, and it's based off of stereotypes. It's based off of perspective. Sometimes, ex you know, experiences or what have you. And um, there's these titles or these labels that were given within a lot of different spaces, especially in the art space and the idea of black art being one thing. And when you think of black art or some, some people may think of black art, they think of it in a certain way. And in this situation, we were able to control the, the narrative, if you will, and to show, you know, showcase a plethora of, uh, of vast, you know, amount of voices within a culture um, and everyone speaking differently, but saying similar things, you know? So just being able to showcase like the, we control this narrative, the, these are our truths. We all have our own unique style and abilities, you know, as you, as you look at the work, like not one, piece of work is similar to the, uh, or is the same as another, the very different mediums or what have you. Um, but I, I, I really like the, the fact that we were able to showcase um, blackness in all of its glory and in all of its complexity, that it's multifaceted, you know? So I think that's, that's the other thing, other piece to it. It's it's not truth because of someone else saying it is, it's truth because we said so. Mm -hmm. Well said, yeah. we are actually out of time. I'm gonna ask 
Aaron, to take one minute and tell us what the plans are for Albright up on Elmwood. No, uh, the plans at, at Albright Elmwood are uh, underway. Mercifully, I'm the curator of public art and not the director. Uh, so, uh, you know, I get to I get to take this ride with the public. Um, we're looking forward to opening in early 2023. As, as many people know, we have hit some supply side delays. That's not unusual given the, the current circumstances. Um, and, you know, the, the price of steel rose. So we need to, you know, adjust some of our uh, uh, fundraising uh, to accommodate for that, but we're we're on on pace to open in early 2023, and I can't wait. You know, I mean, it's it's an addition of 40,000 square feet of exhibition space. Um, you know, we have uh, our our you know old 1905 building is going to be you know renovated to to new standards. The new Wilmers building. Um, the, the Knox building, the 1962 building is going to become a, a free space, you know, open to the public with a pass through to Delaware Park from, from Elmwood Avenue. It'll have the all of our lives and open sky for our town square. We're tripling the amount of our uh, education spaces um, in that wing, uh, in addition to our m and uh, gallery, which will be a, a 2000 square foot gallery. And then of course, you know, the, the, the new jewel will be the Gunlock building uh, there on the north side of campus that'll add that 40,000 square feet of exhibition space, the front lawn. I mean, the deck is being poured right now, so it looks like a big concrete pad, but it's actually gonna be, um, you know, a lawn we're repatriating new green space there on Elmwood. So I really can't wait for that vision to take to take hold. It's been a, a, a work of labor and love from the community and people beyond. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. I feel every day, I feel like I say I landed in Buffalo at the right time and it always feels like the right time now. So we're, we're excited well, to welcome people there. Thank you. These are these are both beautiful feathers in the city of Buffalo's cap. Um, these images, the slides that we've been seeing from In These Truths are spectacular but they're one dimensional so please go and see the show at the Northland Center through June 5th. I very much thank Aaron Ott and I Tina Fareed Cook for joining us. Uh, I need to remind you that Dennis will be back next week. Um, Imagine Buffalo returns at 1230 on Tuesday March 29th. He'll be joined uh, by Michael Weiner and JD Hartman to discuss the art of investing. Folks have a great afternoon. Thanks friends for um, for joining us and being part of this. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so All much. Right. Bye bye.